So we're going to um, tur turn now to uh, Shannon Murray, who uh, is program coordinator, Indian Village and Sweetgrass Lodge at the Calgary Stampede, where she just completed another successful season to make it here uh, to join us uh, for the symposium. She um, took her uh, PhD from uh, University of Calgary, where she's currently also uh, an adjunct assistant professor uh, teaching Canadian history and Canadian studies. Um, at the Stampede in 2017, um, she had the opportunity to facilitate um, uh, sort of a, a hosting arrangement with all seven chiefs from the Treaty 7 territory as parade marshals. And she toured, um, st uh, steal yourselves for this, folks, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau through the Indian Village. And she was sure that was a plum uh, <laughs> opportunity. You still haven't washed your hand from the handshake. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so Shannon's going to talk to us today. Um, uh, about a, an interesting topic that she calls celebration, not recreation, Indian Village at the Calgary Stampede. Please welcome Shannon Murray. Okay, so um, again, Thank you to all of the organizers and all of the people working. I know how it is to put on a big event. Um, so my hat's off to you all for um, this wonderful thing that you've put together. And to all of the scholars who are here um, sharing ideas and um, getting riled up over, over uh, beverages at night, um, I thank you for um, bringing me back to my academic world. Um, I also thank the organizers for including me so that we can have uh, a quick reminder that the West goes North as well. So it's funny to me that this is um, a public memory um, panel because I, I actually just lived it and I'm gonna, I'm gonna live it again a year from now. Um, so I sort of live in this, this middle world where I'm dealing with memory all the time, but I'm also doing it every July. A quick background, just in case you don't know about the Calgary Stampede, um, we'll see you in July 2018. Um, in 1886, the first exhibition occurred in Calgary, and it was just all of the farmers and ranchers coming together in July to um, share the secrets of their success, basically. Then in 1908, um, they had a kind of a special fair, a Dominion Fair, and they brought up this Wild West show, the Miller Brothers 101 from Oklahoma. And two special people were on that. Uh, Guy Wiedek, who was from Rochester, New York, but just fell in love with the West, was a terrible cowboy, but a great showman. And Flores Ledoux, who was from Minnesota, who was a decent cowgirl, but a great roper. And at that time, the two of them, the husband and wife duo, pitched this idea for a farewell to the Old West, a celebration of the frontier. Now at that time, Calgary was like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, we're not a Western city, thank you very much. Uh, we're very sophisticated, we have banking here. <laughs> and, um, and they were really trying to transcend the trappings of their location. They were trying to prove themselves that they could be equal to Toronto, et cetera. Um, but in 1912, they decided, you know, maybe we really are becoming a big city and we're on the precipice of greatness, so perhaps we better call Wiedek and Ledoux back up and have that farewell so we can formally bury it and move on with the rest of the 20th century, Canada's century. So 1912, Guy Wiedek and Flores Ledoux come in March of that year, get $100,000 from four guys to put on the show, a big rodeo, a big parade, and a camp that fall in Calgary. Wiedek's vision of the stampede as a living celebration to the West was not one where he had room for recreation. It was never going to be see the most authentic things redone. It was authentic because of who participated. The people themselves were the people who were there. His vision of celebration, not recreation, still governs the stampede today. It's really important, um, kind of at our core ethos. And his, uh, his vision of inclusivity, all of the people who were there were the people who should be re um, represented each time at the stampede. His inclusion and celebration of First Nations people 
for who they were and for who they are and for who they're going to be is the thing that I work with now all the time. So at the Stampede, we have relationships with families from Treaty 7 territory. Not all of Canada is under treaty, um, but in southern Alberta, we're governed under one treaty, Treaty 7 territory. That's the territory we operate on. That treaty was signed in 1877. So this year, Canada had a really big celebration. It was Canada 150. But that was a lot of questions for Indigenous people who often say, Canada 150,000. <laughs> so, but we also were hitting Treaty 7 140. It was 140 years ago that Treaty 7 was signed in September at Blackfoot Crossing. So here I am as a historian getting ready to celebrate Calgary Stampede balancing Canada 150, 150,000 and Treaty 7 140 and asking, well, how would you want to celebrate it or do you? The five nations of Treaty 7, um, the, the people that I work with most closely, are three Blackfoot nations that are part of the bigger Blackfoot Confederacy that comes down into the United States. So the Pigani, Siksika, and Kainai nations. And then there's, other, th there's two others. Satina so is a Diné nation, and Diné goes all the way from almost the Arctic all the way down way south of here to the American Southwest. And the Stony Nakoda, who came over from uh, Sioux Territory, way east for us. So those are the five nations that had the, were, were signed on to the Treaty 7 um, in 1877. But what they didn't know was that the year before, uh, a nasty, nasty thing called the Indian Act was already signed. The Indian Act is still in place today. It's still the thing that uh, governs the relationship between First Nations people and the Crown as well the, as the government of Canada. Um, but it's the arm that establishes the most restrictive policies. So things like uh, residential schools, the past system um, made it illegal for First Nations to politically organize, to hold their status if they were to marry outside, if they were a woman. And it's basically the arm of assimilation and extermination from the government. This one is going to be a sticky one for poor old Guy Wiedek. So when he comes in 1912 and he finally gets that money, he's like, oh, great, dispatch. We will invite everybody who we worked with and all the old timers that we know to get up here and put on a show. So they invited the best cowgirls. They had cowgirls riding bareback and bronx that year. Um, they went and invited some of the best cowboys. They got some of the best artists. That's a Charlie Russell painting as our first stampede poster. And then he said, oh, and of course we'll get the Indians, right? And, oh, Canada, oh no. Um, well, we have a pass system in place. And the past system, which was in place until the 1960s in Canada, meant that uh, people could not leave the reserves without written express permission from the Indian agent. And the idea of getting written express permission to go be celebrated for being First Nation was not going to fly with the Canadian government and not with the local Indian agents. So it took um, some finessing on the Stampede's part to be able to get them there. Wiedek, however, continued to say, it's not, it, you know, it's just a one-time show, which in the back of his mind, he's like, no, it's not. It's going to be forever, I promise. <laughs> um, it's a one-time show. It's a celebration of the frontier. So it's the stampede the first year round, but it's really this frontier day celebration. And, oh, it's really good up there. So you can see the Remuda. He's got vaqueros promised. He's got Indians. He's got cowboys, cowgirls, anybody you can imagine, even Red River carts. He's got the Métis included. Anybody who was in the West is going to be there. And even though this is a happy time, he says, you know, there's a little quote there. Uh, While this is to be a season of joy, a period rich in reminiscences, an occasion of um, hearty greetings and renewal of old friendships, there will be just a tinge of sadness as we gaze upon the sunset of a dying race. So a bit of a tacit acknowledgement that we can include First Nations this year, but we know what's coming. We know what's coming. They were able to get the passes uh, for 1,800 First Nations people to come to the first stampede, thanks to two local politicians. One, a senator. The other, somebody who's going to go on to become a prime minister. So here's Guy Wiedek with the leaders of Treaty 7 Nations in their regalia, all of which was illegal back in the, in the reserves, standing in the middle of Calgary downtown. 
it's an exceptional site. The idea of putting up camp was flying in the face of what, that rec what um, the Indian Act was supposed to be doing. It was an act of resistance to attend and to be celebrated and to express themselves in their own languages, um, to put on their own ceremonies, public and private, which still continue today, and importantly, to gather 1,800 First Nations people and put them on parade at the very front of the very first Calgary Stampede Parade. This would have been a huge spectacle. No doubt, Guy Wiedek, who was in many ways a showman first, knew what, would, what this would attract. The first uh, Stampede Parade drew 80,000 people. There were 40,000 people living in Calgary at the time. So this is a massive event. And in his mind, if you stood in place, the very first Calgary Stampede Parade, if you stood in place and you watched the whole thing go by, you watched the history of the West. So the very first is all the First Nations people, then we get some traders, then some missionaries, Northwest Mounted Police, then we get some settlers, some ranchers, some agrarians, and then it ended with the trade unions who were building the city. It also included the Governor General. So it was, it was just this grand mishmash that told a very neat story of the West. We don't do that arrangement anymore because the implication, of course, is that First Nations people are not here anymore. So the stampede was, was meh successful in 1912. It rained so badly, um, which, like the presentation yesterday, was indeed the thing that was remembered the most, that it rained. Um, and the money didn't really get made back. So when they were debating whether there would be an, a Calgary stampede in 1913, the economy fell out. So not unlike the same timing as Buffalo Bill. And Calgary said, no, thank you. So it went to Winnipeg, which is fine. It could be in Winnipeg for a year. And it toured a little bit. It didn't come back until 1919. And then in 1923, when the exhibition was failing, they called back Guy Wiedek. And they said, you know who doubled our population of our city that one time? We'll probably call that guy back. And then in 1923 on, we get the same stampede that has never been canceled due to depression, war, natural disaster. Nothing cancels this Calgary stampede. And it was very popular. And it included Indian Village, this encampment of families from Treaty 7 territory. Well, then it got a little too popular for that. And the Indian Act was amended in 1927. And it was um, delightfully including no participation in exhibitions or stampedes. Of course, our name is the Calgary Exhibition and Stampede, so we get it. Uh, we get it. It was about, it was, it was about a, a lot of other organizations, but, but we knew. And but that the, the way that, that Wiedek had laid out this partnership was not one where we could just go like, oh, okay, the Indian Act says no, so bye. Um, Wiedek was still there. He was operating the show, and he had really close relationships with these families. So once again, the Stampede finds a way to subvert and openly break the Indian Act. They said, okay, well, what if we just had um, like older men and then women and children? And then you can keep the young men on the reserves um, they're, they're trying to make them learn how to ranch at this time. So we got approval for the passes for that, but we still also were like, oh, but we need the cowboys, because the cowboys, I mean, that's not, that's not Indian Village, Th they're just being cowboys, right? So in 1927, despite the Indian Act, we still have an Indian Village, and we still have First Nations com competitors in the Calgary Stampede Rodeo, who win almost all the categories. The stampede continued throughout the 20th century to become a safe zone. Um, some people, some elders in the, in the, res in the um, uh, village still call it uh, like a jailbreak, that they were able to get off the reserve for five, seven, ten days and be themselves without anybody watching. During the day, they're spectators, but at night when the village closes, it's their own space on their own terms. Many folks in Indian Village used it as an economic boost, a much needed economic boost, as tourists would offer a dollar or two to get their photo taken. It was also a place where their kids could play, run, learn their languages, and be children freely during a time of residential schools. So the Stampede continues to be a pretty special and unique place, a place where all nations from Treaty 7 come together as equals, 
and a place that has actually been called out um, at the highest levels of Canadian government as a model of reconciliation. During this time, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, ca Canada's been going through a process called reconciliation. And it's basically um, a time where Canadians are coming to terms with the government-created assimilation and extermination policies that were uh, created and implemented throughout the 20th century and the, and the 19th century. And many of the people who come and camp at Indian Village uh, were part of this system. They still s in some ways are. And so the idea of having an equal partnership with First Nations people and having a spot where there's intergenerational exchange and intercultural exchange makes the, the stampede kind of a special and unique thing for us. But that gets us to the name every time. So in Canada, we don't use the word Indian. It, 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 is, not, it is not really a word we can use. If you'll notice, I've been using First Nation. That's the word um, that we use most typically. So the one question we always get is, why do you call it Indian Village? If you're, if you're a safe space, if you're a good partner, what's going on? But in fact, um, the 26 teepee holders at the Stampede, we ask them annually, what, do, what would you like with the name? If you want the name, we'll support it, we'll fight it. If you don't want the name, we're, we're your partners, we'll help you change it. And right now, the response, the overwhelming response is actually the name honors Guy Wiedek. And it, and it honors what the Stampede did as a, to create a safe space for us to be us in, in a time of restriction. So at this point, I'm respecting their wishes, I'm acting as their partner, and I'm supporting them with their name. Um, it doesn't mean it won't change in the future, but as long as that's their wish, that's what we will support. Here, this is Guy Wiedek in 1952 uh, with Flores Ledoux, th one of their last visits together. She died just after that, and he died a year later. Um, and he still is venerated by many of the people who um, remain at Indian Village. So what is it now? What do you go to see now? Um, it's still a place for intergenerational exchange and, and uh, learning. Our youth programs are one of the biggest things that bring TP owners back. It's one thing I hear all the time is we need to just make sure our youth are still learning the cultures. So we have, um, of course, we have our own Kids Day powwow, all of these kind of things, but we also have kids opportunities to learn year-round in, indi in indigenous youth programs. When you come, there's 26 teepees set up in a circle, and each teepee has a, a schedule where they will be open to the public. And this is one of the biggest things, the most unique thing, I think, about the stampede that sets it apart from a reenactment or a show. Inside the open teepees, they'll show their heirlooms, their family history through material cultures. It's not a reenactment. It's not this is how we lived before contact, or this is how we lived just after contact. It's an opportunity for them to show what they have preserved of their family. So you'll see 100-year-old buckskins worn by um, one of the last uh, traditional Satina chiefs, Chief Crowchild. You'll also be able to speak with teepee owners. And for some non-Indigenous Canadians, this is the first time and maybe the only time they're going to speak directly with someone who's First Nations. So here's our 26 teepees. Many of them have had uh, a presence in the Stampede since 1912. That's the other thing that sort of sets the Stampede apart from a Buffalo Bill show or our, our Miller Brothers 101. It doesn't travel. There were a couple of here and there other places, but since 1923, it's always been the Calgary Stampede, so it allows roots to grow. In 1912, it was Ben Caffrobe from Siksika who helped Wiedek figure out how to bring people together, get Siksika to come to Calgary. And it was, I'm sure, no coincidence that Siksika was the only nation to get to camp on the park that year. The calf robe teepee, which you can see in kind of the, the background on, the, on your far left there in 1912, is still in the Stampede Indian Village today, and it's been handed down three generations. And Norin calf robe, when you speak to him, one of his big things that he's most passionate about is ending the Hollywood Indian stereotype. He said, I just want to meet people and help them understand my culture, help them learn about who we are and who we're going to be, and that we're not a thing of the past. We're not gone. We're still here. So from Wiedek's first visit to Calgary 
1908, where he promised, um, I swear we could probably all together have one big celebration of the West, to 1912 where he got that invite. And he's very clear in that invitation that the West goes from the Athabasca River down beyond the Rio Grande. He meant the West. It was not a nationalistic effort. There was not a tie to American cowboys, Canadian cowboys, Mexican cowboys. It was all the people who were here should be celebrated. All of the people who were here should be celebrated. We will not reenact, we will not recreate what was there, but it changes over time. It is living history. So in 1912, when a Kainai cowboy won the overall Canadian championship, to 1927, when Pete Bruce had won under very um, restricted circumstances under the new Indian Act registrations, we still get the people who were here, the people living their lives, the way the West was, the way the West is, and the way the West is about to be. So with that, I I'm gonna open an invitation to all of you to come up to see public memory in action um, next July and in Calgary at the Stampede. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, that's terrific.